We quote Caddyshack all the time, like we quote Shakespeare all the time and don't know that it's from Caddyshack or from Shakespeare, right? Some movies, I don't even know why we review them. They just <laughs> exist in the world and, and they're just, there's nothing we can do about it uh, in a good way or a bad way. They're just, they're there and they're iconic and they're institutions. I'm speaking, of course, of 1980s Caddyshack, uh, which is Christie's latest selection in our ongoing series. Was it great or were you eight? Tell us about it. Playing a good game. That's all he got out of that one. And talking a better one. Hey, I should have stayed home and played with myself. This is my favorite thing that we do. Well, actually, one of my many favorite things that we do. <laughs> I also enjoy the table for ones we do with folks who mm, want to have yes. a one-on-one -on -one review with us. Those are always a joy as well. Um, I guess going back, though, is always a pleasure. And looking at movies through fresh eyes, with different perspective, looking at it through the prism of what has come since. And as you say, like, Caddyshack is just part of the fiber of our lives. Like, <laughs> like I didn't even have to go back and rewatch Caddyshack. Like I had just seen it a couple of years earlier. We showed it to Nick. Caddyshack is sort of your, like your prototype of the slobs versus snobs, 80s raunchy comedy. I feel like it sort of set the template for everything. Like, you know, you've got Porky's, you've got Revenge of the Nerds, all those movies. I feel like they all owe that debt to Caddyshack. And this Animal is, House. A Animal House, yeah, it's around then too, I guess. Yes, yeah, that's 78, right? So yeah. this is a around the same time. But this is the feature filmmaking debut of Harold Ramis. We just talked about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire last week and how Harold Ramis's shadow still looms large over all of that, that whole world. Um, but this is his feature filmmaking debut, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, it takes place at a golf course and there are people who are jerky snobs like Ted Knight. And there are people who want to be a part of that, like Rodney Dangerfield. And then there are all the caddies who are just trying to scrape together, you know, a few bucks and get high and have sex with each other. And then Bill Murray is just, you know, the greens keeper who is Assistance. just an odd I'm sorry, assistant. I'm sorry. Yes, assistant <laughs> greenskeeper who is just a total oddball. And Chevy Chase shows up and is just like that very particular brand of Chevy Chase, just understated, sly. You can see the seeds of Ryan Reynolds' entire persona in <laughs> Chevy Chase's per performance here. Um, so it's hilarious. Like it's infinitely quotable. I say this all the time. We quote Caddyshack all the time. Like we quote Shakespeare all the time and don't know that it's from Caddyshack or from Shakespeare, right? Um, when you say, so I got that going for me, which is nice, or like be the ball, or what, what there are so many things that we say in our daily lives that come from the script, which Harold Ramis co-wrote with Brian Doyle Murray and Douglas Doug Kenny. Kenny. Yeah. So um, I think it's still great. You know, it's still really funny, extremely of its time. And I don't know that Caddyshack like this could exist today. I feel like a movie like Wet Hot American Summer comes along and very knowingly kind of is an homage to that kind of film. Sure. But I don't know. Could could you do Caddyshack today in, in, in an ironic way? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I did have to go back and watch it. And what I realized yeah. was that I'd never really seen the whole thing all the way through. Oh, like, wow. I had seen all the all the Roddy Dangerfield, Ted Knight scenes. I had mm -hmm. seen all the Bill Murray and the Gopher scenes. But there were just like other parts of the film that had just sort of escaped my radar. And I have to say, a lot of the other parts of the film don't really work. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't care about the caddies at all like they are there there is michael o'keefe bless his heart is you know pouring his heart into this but like they they're none of them are written in a particularly interesting way i didn't really care about their you know their goals like they're kind of an afterthought in this movie which mainly i think exists to structure the 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 ted knight stuff with the rodney mm -hmm. dangerfield bits the the bill murray stuff which apparently during shooting they kept adding more scenes because mm -hmm. they realized that they were really working and then apparently then they realized oh wait chevy chase and bill murray are the stars of this thing and they don't have a scene together so the apparently the two of them and ramus sat down over lunch one day and came up with the one scene where chevy chase goes over to to, to brian murray's little you know shack that he lives bill in murray. <laughs> bill murray yeah it's a bit of a mess and and i don't know that a major studio would make a movie that is this aimless you know like uh and, and you you read about the making of it and there was you know a fair share of cocaine going around um <laughs> 
But, you know, obviously what's there, there's a lot of really immortal comedy stuff, whether it's the, you know, the, 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 the Bill Murray goofiness. I mean, the, 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 the right individual is basically doing his routine, but in a context where he's doing it to someone else. So his stuff with Ted Knight is hilarious, you know, and we gave us the, well, we're waiting gift, you know. <laughs> Uh, so I mean it's entertaining. I I, I enjoyed watching it, but I, mm -hmm. I I also it's I think it's a movie that people have a lot of fondness for, and that's what sort of carried it through this way through. But if you look at it fairly in a, through an objective lens, it's kind of a mess. So it's not great. So people were just eight, and they're remembering it through nostalgia. Uh, I mean, I'm not. Look, there are there are worse comedies that are better structured, you know. So <laughs> I, I would I would say this: like, even if I think that it's a bit of uh, a bit of all over the place, the laughs are there, and the laughs mm -hmm. are solid and frequent enough that it holds up in that mm -hmm. respect. But uh, you know. Uh, I, I think I kind of saw it the right way the first time, which was just sort of seeing these bits mm -hmm. out of context, you know, and within themselves that were funny without having to go through the whole plot about whether or not he gets the scholarship, you know. Right. The connective <laughs> tissue is not as interesting. Eh, not I agree. really. <laughs> but feels very, very of its time. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, but it is of its time because it's 1980 when this comes out. Mm -hmm. And so you're having like the late 70s, kind of early 80s, like the beginning of conspicuous consumption and and sort of, you know, like a, a backlash against really ostentatious wealth, which is well, everything that, you know, Judge Smales represents. I mean, here's the thing, though. We're, we're about to go right into the official preppy handbook era. So, like, mm -hmm. the, the, the bad guys of a movie like Animal House and Caddyshack, everyone's going to be dressing like them about a year later. Everyone's going to be wearing their Lacoste shirts and they're going to have their, you know, they're going to be looking like they're going to the country club mm -hmm. more than they look like, you know, the, the, the good guys of these movies who are the kind of unkempt slobs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for better or worse, the, 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 that those early years of Reagan were all about like pressing your khakis and, and, you know, you're getting your L.O. bean loafers or whatever, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I recall though, as a kid, the Caddyshack seems so naughty. Like mm -hmm. everything with Lacey Underalls. You remember my niece, Lacey Underalls. Like that's the thing that Chris and I just say randomly to each other sometimes. You remember my niece, Lacey Underalls. Um, but things like that, like it seemed so like sexy and naughty, like all the stuff with Chevy Chase and he was such a playboy and he could get mm -hmm. away with anything because he was so charming. Like that all seemed very grown up to me. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I wish that character had more to her than like there to sleep with two of the male leads. But I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Cindy Morgan is trying to like build a character out of that, you know, and bring an edge to it, right? Bring something yeah, like, kind of yeah. naughty and daring to it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, because I think at least you know she is she comes off as a character with agency. You know, she mm -hmm. goes after what she wants and she enjoys what she wants, and mm -hmm. the movie's not like you know condemning her for it. Um, but that's kind of all she's there to do, unfortunately. You know, there's the the pregnancy subplot. Is that actress actually Irish or is she just doing an accent? Because it it feels real accenty to me. She this. This is the same actress who plays the underage girl in Animal House. That, Sarah that, Holcomb. Yes, that Pinto is American. Okay, yeah. So that she's putting <laughs> on a really thick uh, 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 Irish accent for reasons unknown, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I just I think there this, this movie is is all over the place. Now, I'm not going to go so far as our good friends, Whitney and Bibbs, who insist that Caddyshack 2 is a far superior film, because that's insane. That um, feels like a contrarian shit-taking, shit-stirring take, I, right? I, I guess. I mean, I, look, they'll, they'll explain it to you. They're not just, you know, they, they, <laughs> they, they, they have the receipts to back up this yeah. claim. I'm not going to go there with them. I will say, however, that I like the Kenny Loggins song from Caddyshack 2 as much as the um, one from Caddyshack 1, if not maybe better, but, you know, that's it's a go for dancing to it at the end, uh, though. Uh, of course, yes. The go for <laughs> dances in the second one, but Dan Aykroyd is now the groundskeeper, and it's very bizarre. Is there a favorite line for you from Caddyshack? Uh, the last time I saw a hat like that, it came with a bowl of soup. That's a pretty. <laughs> that's a great line. <laughs> yeah, basically, as you say, like Dangerfield is just doing his bit 
but in front of other people, like interacting with them. And so everything yeah. he says is just gold. So, oh, but on you, it looks good. <laughs> I don't recall. Do we do numbers? We don't. Oh, we just say God, if it's great or if, if we were eight. Yeah. Uh, All right. So it's not great, you're saying? <laughs> No, oh, I, I mean, I wish these are the, 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 again, this is the fresh rotten conundrum. It's binary. It, it's, it's not because you were eight. So I will say that it's great, even though I will say it's also a hot mess. I think it's great just because it holds up. And I think about all the raunchy comedies that came along that um, have that or strive for that same spirit. Yeah. But, are totally forgettable and not nearly as quotable. Like there's a reason that we keep quoting Caddyshack. For sure. And it's just, and so I think that alone makes it stand out and maybe seem great still. But if you want to see a really good comedy that's more about actual golf, Tin Cup. Ah, oh, Tin Cup. Let's do something <laughs> different. All right. No dancing gophers in Tin Cup. All right. Thank you for joining me. We're going to have a poll on the community tab. Was it great or was I just eight on Caddyshack? Let us know what you think. And Alonzo will pick next. And I can't wait to find out what he chooses. So thanks for playing along with us.